OpenAI can finally spell strawberry. Fortinet overshares a little. NVIDIA sells to Salesforce. MasterCard records a big purchase. HP looks for a little autonomy remittance. IBM picks up Kube cost. Beam grabs Alcyon. And Intel founds their foundries in this week's episode of the Gestalt IT Rundown. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown for Wednesday, September the 18th. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and I am back with you once again for some amazing rundown action. And joining me, of course, is my co-host this week, John Schwartz. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Tom. Well, we're glad to have you here. Uh, I hope that you've gone out and hugged your favorite greeting card writer day because that is the oddly specific day for today. Um, it's also National Cheeseburger Day, so I know what I'm going to be having for lunch right after we go through all of these great rundown news stories because it has been a packed week with lots of news. And we're going to start off with that open AI story because they have a new model codenamed Strawberry that can perform human-like reasoning tasks, and that could give them a temporary edge in a very crowded field. But should humanity be happy? The O1 model series is designed to spend more time computing the answer before they respond to user queries, though it can't browse the web or analyze files yet. OpenAI is expected to announce a $6.5 billion funding round any day now and said that the O1 series is best suited for tasks like math and coding. John, what are your thoughts on Strawberry? Good and bad. Um... You know, the enhanced reasoning capabilities are going to be useful if you're tackling complex problems in science, coding, math, and similar areas. Um, healthcare researchers can annotate cell sequencing data. Um, physicists generate complicated mathematical formulas needed for quantum optics. I mean, there's a huge upside, but what always concerns me, Tom, is in its quest, never-ending quest, to be ahead of everyone else in AI, OpenAI sometimes seems to me to be in too much of a hurry and kind of left behind are the security issues or the ramifications for what this might mean for us as humanity. I mean, I spoke to a guy uh, who's the chief product officer of Palo Alto Networks, Lee Clurich, and he said there's always excitement about AI advancement. There's also concerns. And I, I think those are the type of concerns that led to a number of OpenAI executives leaving the company over their concerns about security. Um, and in a sense, it's something that Sam Altman has, 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 has doubled down on. I know he talked to Oprah recently, but he's talked, talked to as many people as possible to tell them he's going to be more responsible. He's not going to be the Zuckerberg of AI in a sense, uh, although there is a lot of trust me element to this. So there is that element that I'm still concerned about, uh, in their zeal again, to get ahead of everyone. And, and and we'll see when it when it plays out. But I think you know who's going to be watching are going to be the, the regulators. They're already looking at OpenAI, so the FTC is going to take it even a deeper look. And um, they got to be on their best behavior. Um, and they're going to have to thread the needle between being far ahead of everyone, doing things that are were not thought possible just a few months ago, and then dealing with the repercussions if things go badly. Fortinet is back in the news for yet another data breach. This time, attackers were able to nab about 440 gigabytes of data from a misconfigured Azure SharePoint server. The culprit, calling themselves Forte B Word, uploaded the data to Amazon and shared the credentials to an S3 bucket for verification. The attacker tried to extort money from the security firm but was rebuffed, so they moved to the next step. Fortinet has also has not confirmed the nature of the stolen files, but has notified affected customers. Tom, are you going to make a cool hacker name like that one? I mean, honestly, how can I top Forta B word rhymes with which? Um, that, look, this this is the same old song and dance, right? We've talked about this so many times. I feel like I could just put bullet points up on the screen at this point. Um, you have a lot of your customers' data. You need to make sure that it is um, secured. You need to do things with it that, um, I don't know, encrypted at rest would be a really great idea. Um, we don't know if the SharePoint problem was one of the numerous exploits that we've seen in SharePoint or just good old-fashioned, we don't know how to configure SharePoint because anybody who's ever done that will tell you it is, it's not fun. 
440 gigs is nothing to sneeze at. And the fact that um, Mr. FB has, or Miss FB, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to assume here, uh, has uh, uploaded all of this to an S3 bucket and basically said, here, I can prove I have it, says that this is kind of a big deal. I'm leaning more towards um, maybe somehow they got uh, credential access rather than uh, pulling off a SharePoint exploit just from the sheer volume of data that they got. It, who knows? It could even be an insider threat. We we really don't know at this point. I think ultimately what needs to happen is, is that all of the people, yes, you, the ones watching this show right now, because I know so many of our people out there that are uh, you know responsible for data hygiene in companies watch the rundown and we, we appreciate your patronage but i need you once this episode is over to go and make sure that all of the permissions on your cloud storage buckets are correct remember we had that problem with s3 buckets for a long time where they were leaky by default and amazon finally fixed that but don't think that that means that microsoft's done the same or google or oracle or ibm or any of these other cloud providers if you're going to keep customer data in the cloud you need to make sure that those buckets are rock solid because if you don't you're probably going to end up making the news and have a hacker like i don't know like storage goblin who's uh who's telling you that they're paying this huge cloud hosting bill to be able to embarrass you publicly in front of everyone so just just do that for me guys because i promise you it'll, it'll be a whole lot easier now than it will be in the future Right, the Jensen Wong World Tour continues. This week, our leather-jacketed AI guru had Mark Benioff opening for him during Dreamforce 2024. Oh yeah, and they announced that Salesforce is going to be the latest company that cozies up to the AI giant. What are the outcomes of this massive amount of hardware that's being sold? Well, that would be autonomous agents and interactive avatars. The move is part of the larger agent force announcement that was made last week that has Salesforce gearing up to take on Microsoft. And of course, anytime a, a company like NVIDIA manages to sell massive amounts of hardware to yet another massive technology company out there, John, I have to ask, what's the big deal about uh, Salesforce adopting NVIDIA AI hardware? I don't know if it's really a big deal. I know it's a big deal for Salesforce. For NVIDIA, it's just another Jensen on stage talking to fill in the blank, Adobe, ServiceNow, whomever. He is everywhere at once. So he was there Tuesday night talking to Benioff in what was kind of a strange psychiatric evaluation of, of where Salesforce is as an AI company. And basically, here's the, the partnership is, as you said, to develop these AI features for large customers, autonomous agents, interactive avatar experiences. They want to optimize predictive and generative AI workflows, particularly for three different things, for crisis management in the event of a product recall or service outage, real-time weather impacts for travel and logistics for the supply chain, and then real-time customer service resolution, so you're not saying representative five times. Um, I think for Salesforce, this is significantly more of an upside. They basically want to redefine their enterprise business, and they are going to deploy over the next few years billions of these agent force agents, these autonomous agents. Um, they uh, anticipate advances in your user experiences, and in a sense, they see an opportunity. And for NVIDIA, of course, they glob on to the second largest enterprise software company in the world after Microsoft. And it's interesting though, Tom, during their conversation, they almost talked about these, these agents as new employees at companies doing the, the grunt work that the employees at most companies don't wanna do. So in a sense, uh, Jensen said, when you create a new agent, it's gonna be uh, a lot more about welcoming a new team member or on onboarding in employees. In, in a sense, he's saying that so much work's gonna get done that when you arrive to work, your to-do list will be shaved significantly. And uh, Benioff, of course, is, is, is eating into this. He's hoping that, that Jensen's right. We'll see, uh, as everyone knows, Salesforce has taken a lumping and a kind of a beating in the sales and the, the, the stock market over the last several months because it's perceived to be behind. I'm not, I'm not necessarily buying to that fully, but I think they do have a perception problem. And I think with NVIDIA, this boosts their credibility, especially on Wall Street where expectations are bizarre to begin with. When you're a MasterCard, you have unlimited credit 
So why not go shopping? In this case, the credit card giant is paying $2.65 billion for threat intelligence firm Recorded Future. The two companies already have a robust partnership with Recorded Future helping prevent credit card fraud. The current plan is to integrate fraud prevention and identity services together to provide more holistic threat intelligence, both for MasterCard customers as well as others in need of cybersecurity help. What do you think of this purchase, Tom? Well, you know, security is something that money can't buy, but for everything else, evidently, there's now MasterCard. I I think this is a good move. It's it's a little puzzling, right? Because normally you would expect a company like Recorded Future to go to a, a cybersecurity provider, like, I don't know, like a Microsoft or Palo Alto Networks or somebody like that. The fact that MasterCard is picking them up means that they've seen the value in this threat intelligence. And I think that the fact that they already have this pre-existing partnership with uh, credit card fraud detection is important in this whole thing because one if recorded future is saving them millions of dollars in credit card fraud transactions every year there's the payoff right like like if if you're saving us i don't know let's just throw out a random number 250 million dollars a year but i'm already paying recorded future for that service then i get recorded future service for free which increases the amount of money that i save in credit card fraud transactions which means that $2.65 $2.65 billion gets paid back even faster, right? That's just the aspect of what they were already using the service for and what they were gaining out of it. Now that they own Recorded Future, they have a revenue stream for this. They can take the threat intelligent pieces and then sell them to other companies, which I guarantee you they will. And given this, I have a peculiar feeling that what's going to happen is, is that a lot of this is going to go into the finance sector, right? Like we're seeing these kinds of transactions that look fraudulent, or we're seeing this kind of um, you know effort to use AI to manipulate things. Because that was one of the things that Recorded Future was really starting to get into was this AI um, security uh, aspect of things. So as more and more fears arise that AI is being used to manipulate financial markets, I think that Recorded Future is going to have a very interesting niche when it comes to making sure that people understand what is capable and how they can prevent that. And if that means that MasterCard gets a little bit more money in their pocket at the end of the fiscal year, I think MasterCard's totally going to be fine with that. Um, I I just wonder who Visa is going to go out and buy next. All right, the saga of HP and autonomy isn't quite finished yet. You may recall back in January, there was a successful trial against former CFO uh, Susavan Hussein, uh, and then that meant that HPE was free to seek up to $4 billion in damages from former CEO Mike Lynch. You're probably pausing at that statement because Lynch and five other people were killed when their yacht sank in a freak storm off the coast of Sicily. They interviewed CEO Antonio Neri from HPE, and he says that HPE has a fiduciary responsibility to get that money back from the estate of Lynch, and though it feels kind of morbid, he does have to do it. They're also looking to get a repayment of the legal fees on this case that's somewhere in the neighborhood of about $50 million. So I I understand that HPE is still a little sore over the whole autonomy thing, but really, $4 billion from a guy that just passed away? This is a bad look, no matter how you look at it, no matter how deep the feelings are between HPE and autonomy. And they were deep. They went back years and years and years. This is one of the longest running scandals or or fierce fights in tech that I can remember. Just a little personal history, Tom. Um, A friend of mine worked for Mike Lynch and had a falling out with him. And and, and she told me that what he did or what his, his business ethics basically were, were let's, let's just say on the on the, the bad ends. I'll use that just a very plain word because in, in respect to somebody who just passed away, uh, the fact that HPE would pursue something like this, does that either speaks to the vindictiveness of their thoughts towards him or a potential or a huge financial need? Whatever, whatever the case, it's probably something that should not be done. And every time they bring this case up or there's any type of press around it is near address, they're in a no-win situation. I think the best policy really is to walk away. I mean, five people died, right? Or excuse me, six people died. So I, I, I just think HPE could spend their time doing better things and let history and bygones be bygones. 
IBM wants to keep a close eye on the bottom line for their customers, so they're picking up tube costs to make it happen. The startup helps people monitor their cloud spending by controlling and optimizing container usage. It helps avoid over-provisioning and also has API access to billing, which means customers get up-to-the-minute pricing for their deployments. The acquisition is specifically targeting FinOps teams. With more on this story, let's go to our cloud expert, Stephen Dickens. So thanks, guys. It's a, it's a really interesting acquisition for me. The way I'd describe it is a tuck-in. IBM has been in this space for a while. They've got Turbonomic. They've got Astana. They made the acquisition of Aptio with the cloudability stuff. I think where Rob Thomas, the SVP for software within IBM, is kind of taking this, and he hinted at some of this when we were at IBM Think earlier on in the year, is... And I'm, try I'm trying to think of the right language. He's calling it automation. I don't think it's automation. I think he's right on the strategy. I don't think he's right on the term. So let me expand. If you look at IBM's assets, both now and once this acquisition closes and once the <clears throat> HashiCorp acquisition closes, IBM's going to have a portfolio both within its own software stack and within Red Hat's that covers Ansible, and HashiCorp from an automation perspective. It's going to have Cloudability, Turbonomic, Astana from a FinOps perspective, obviously this cube cost. Then it's going to have assets within the OpenShift portfolio. I think where I see the trajectory of this over time is I see all those assets coming together into a holistic whole that is going to give enterprises the ability to manage a cloud-native microservices-based, hybrid, multi-cloud environment. I just said a lot of buzzwords all in one sentence. So what does that mean? The ability to manage containerized applications, automate those, and be able to provide deep, deep and rich FinOps functionality around that new structure. As we see the likes of VMware and what is now Broadcom move towards more a private cloud model, the ability to operate independently of cloud provider and provide that stack across the whole um, landscape is going to be the opportunity for IBM. There's a lot of integration work to be done there, but that broad vision of Hashi, Red Hat, some of the assets that IBM's got, I think is the interesting opportunity for me. It's going to be fascinating to see how Rob builds that out and how that operates. Are we going to see HashiCorp operate like Red Hat with this one with CubeCost? I think that's more an obvious tuck-in. I don't see them having to do um, organizational gymnastics with that. It's more an acquisition of capability. Interesting discussion of whether that um, where that fits, whether that goes into the kind of Aptio um, type space within IBM. I think it will do. Looking at some of the assets within OpenShift, there's a cost management component there. Will that de get deprecated as they move to cube cost? That's some of the roadmap work. And, and as this gets closer to closing, that's where I expect to be looking and getting briefings. But when I step back and look at this holistically, I think IBM's building a portfolio exactly where customers are moving to around containerized micro microservices and automation. And if they can pull off the integration of all these assets, they're going to be really well placed. So exciting times ahead for IBM. I think we're starting to see where the new IBM is going to be going over the next five to 10 years. Fascinating time. So I'll hand it back to you guys, but that's my take. We had a story we wanted to take a closer look at this week. And of course, we're going to be talking about Intel, because if you haven't been paying attention, we've talked at length about them this year. They're trying to turn that ship and add more profitability to the ledger. And one of the things that we have discussed is how one of their biggest crown jewels is the foundry business. It has been the recipient of a large amount of government funding through the CHIPS Act. It's also trying to play catch up with TSMC and several others. Now, news broke yesterday that Intel has announced that their foundry business will be spun off into a separate subsidiary entity. The new unit will have its own board 
and be free to be free to seek outside funding, including a potential IPO down the road. Intel stock jumped 8% in after hours trading on this news. And this is just the latest in a long string of changes at the tech giant under the helm of Mr. Pat Gelsinger. Now, I know it seems like we cover Intel every other week on the rundown, but given the gravity of what they have to do in the industry, I thought this was a big story that we needed to spend a little bit of time talking about. So, John, I'm going to start with you. Do you think Intel spinning out their foundry business is going to be a good move in the long run? Well, in the short run, the street thinks so. I think in the long run, probably it is. Um, They have to do something drastic. They've been trying to do things drastically for the last couple of years. I'm a big fan of Pat Gelsinger, but I think in a sense, he's kind of in the same spot that Marissa Mayer was in with Yahoo, except this isn't quite as bad as that. It's almost a no-win situation. So he's inherited this company that we all can agree on that missed its opportunities along the way and has fallen behind. And now it's drastically trying anything and everything that will stick to the wall. Uh, So I, in a sense, applaud him. And I also think this is something he has to do. He has to do something dramatic because I'm not sure how long the clock is going to be ticking on his CEO stewardship. So it's an interesting spot that Pat's in because he inherited a company that quite honestly was mismanaged by Bob Swan. Uh, Bob, Bob just wanted revenue whatever it took to get the revenue, spend out however much money it takes to make the revenue numbers go up. And the problem with that is that when a company has high revenue numbers, um, people get addicted to that, right? Oh, we want to see big numbers coming out of Intel. And unfortunately, those people are the ones that control the stock. Um, You know what it reminds me of? It's the people who walk into the gym on January 1st and are upset on January 15th when they don't have a six pack of abs and they have, you know, big, well-defined muscles. Um, They do know that this takes time, right? Um, Those people, funny enough, work on Wall Street because they believe that every company in the world should be able to execute a massive turnaround plan in about three months. Because if you can't do things on a quarter by quarter basis, then you're useless and we need to fire you and we need to get rid of you and all this other stuff. And does that sound like the kind of uh, people that you want to work for? Because it doesn't sound like the people that I want to work for. Foundries can't be done in three months. I, I think I even said on, on a previous episode of The Rundown, it doesn't matter how many resources you throw at this. A foundry cannot be built in three months. It, it can barely be built in three years. And the problem is, is that Pat is facing strong headwinds from the people who control the purse strings, a.k.a. the Wall Street folks. So he needs to create a win. And this is not the win that I think he wanted to create. But it's the one that will get people off of his back for a little bit. Because this is a cautionary tale about a former tech giant who overinvested in technologies that maybe they weren't ready for. And they were headed down the tubes really fast. And what they needed was Wall Street to get off their back for a few minutes for them to be able to make that massive turnaround. And quite honestly, the best thing that happened to them was when Wall Street basically forgot about them for a few years and let them execute that turnaround in private. And then they came out on the other side, a much better, stronger, healthier company. And I'm not talking about Intel. I'm talking about IBM because the exact same thing happened to IBM. If you'll remember the string of failures that were OS2 warp and blue lightning and every other thing, it made Wall Street angry. And when Wall Street gets angry, they give you really short deadlines. You know, it's like when you tell your teenagers that they have to be back exactly at 1029 or they're going to get grounded. Um, No teenager is going to be back right on the minute. And so they need this time to recover. They Getting the foundry business out from underneath Intel and not letting that impact their bottom line means that Pat can do a little bit more restructuring, get rid of some of those things that maybe they shouldn't have invested in. Uh, But like you said, he inherited a bad situation. I think he's still doing as much as he can with it, especially now that everybody in the world is just going gaga for the leather jacket AI guru. And, and, you know, he's, he, like you said, all he has to do is show up on stage and say, hello, my name is Jensen Wong and I'm here at company name. And they just bought a whole bunch of stuff from us to do thing that they said they're going to do. Like that's easy street. Like uh, what's going to happen when that doesn't happen with AI anymore? What happens when the, the, either the bottom falls out of the market or there are so many new entrants into the market that suddenly you have to actually work for a living. 
well, then you're going to look a lot like Pat Gelsinger. You're going to be busy trying to figure out how to keep this ship profitable. And, and I don't want this to kind of turn into a cheerleading session for Pat, but what I want people to understand is that you need to give companies that are this big a little bit more time to unwind these things. And getting rid of the foundries is probably the best thing they can do right now because somebody will invest in those foundries. That is a given because they're going to want that money and they're going to want that revenue stream. The question is, well, the people who invest in those foundries have a little bit more patience than the people who are currently beating the door down in Intel trying to get their money back. You know, you, you mentioned the 90, well, the 90 day shot clock, right? That is the bane of any CEO. Wall Street, they're impatient. I, mean, as a, I used to be a financial journalist before I came over here. And the, the pressure these guys are under and the unrealistic expectations is, is, is incredible. And you compound that with, as you mentioned, Bob Swan's mismanagement of the company. Oh, and throw in the fact that they're late to the party with mobile and AI. And you have this, this toxic stew, which is almost impossible to get rid of the stench. And Pat, in a sense, is running whack-a-mole style from one issue to another to another. This, as you said, Tom, will maybe free him up. Maybe it, it creates um, something, some sort of positive news they need. Now, on the flip side, you mentioned our friend Jensen. He's shown up everywhere at everything. You know, he's the Forrest Gump of, of AI movement. Well, that's going to work for a while until it doesn't. What I mean is when there are cracks in the fissure, when there are cracks of, of uh, oh, I don't know, the NVIDIA being investigated, um, there, that's another story, or the fact that they don't meet their ROI numbers, which Wall Street dinged them for, as you remember, and their stock took a hit. Those are going to inevitably happen. And if AI doesn't take off very, very soon in terms of revenue, as reported by companies, he's going to find himself not quite as of an issue as Pat Gelsinger is in, but he's going to start feeling some of the some of the pain of of not meeting expectations because Wall Street's a very cruel and and I'd say unrealistic place. I will remind everybody out there as well that when you are the scrappy underdog. You can take lots of risks and maybe a few gambles to get where you're at. And it wasn't that long ago that NVIDIA was a floundering company that was trying to pivot their gaming business into something more enterprise focused because they knew they couldn't sell these massive gaming graphics cards to people forever. And now that they're at the top of the hill and they are the clear leader in the market, do you think Wall Street wants them to take a gamble or a risk on anything? No, they want companies like that to play it safe and continue to produce, you know, 12% year over year growth and bump the stock price and pay a dividend every once in a while. And they get punished when they try to do things like that, kind of like Intel did. The good news is, is that when those companies fall off the top of the mountain, like Intel did, they stop getting the attention, which means they can go back to taking those risks. And then you can go, ooh, yeah, that was a really good move. I don't know where that came from. I'm so glad that Intel's back. And the cycle just perpetuates itself over and over again. All of this has happened before. All of this will happen again. You know, in I, Hollywood, oh, I was going to mention in Hollywood, they, they have the rags to riches to rags story. Silicon mm -hmm. Valley has the same thing. I just wanted to throw that in. No, no, you're absolutely right. And I hope that we're, we're Pat's on the way out of the second rags, right? Like, like th this, we all want him to succeed ultimately. And, and I don't think anybody wants Intel to go out of business, except for the people who are just so distraught that they're not getting their dividend payment this, this quarter that they, they'd rather blow the whole thing up and, what, sell off the assets? Well, Pat just did that because the foundry is probably going to be the most valuable part of that combined company for a long time to come, other than a patent portfolio that nobody's going to want to pay for. So to all of those investors out there with itchy trigger fingers that's restarted the shot clock, be careful what you wish for. Or, you know what, just sell it and invest in, I don't know, canned food and shotguns. All right, well, that will just about do it for this episode of the Gestalt IT Rundown. Uh, we have a busy week ahead, and we actually have a busy month ahead. Uh, you may notice John's my co-host this week, and it's because Stephen Foskett is actually out at Edge Field Day right now. Um, he has a great lineup of presenters. They're going to be uh, taking the stage, including VMware, Sedata, Avasa, OnLogic, and T-Second. So make sure you head over to techfieldday.com and check out all of that great coverage. 
And then next week, I'm going to be out because I'm going to be uh, doing a special event with our friends over at Nokia. We're going to be doing Networking Field Day exclusive. Uh, make sure you tune in September 24th for that. We've got all day coverage. We have some exciting announcements and some really cool technology that you're not going to want to miss. And then October 2nd and 3rd, the very next week after that, Stephen is going to be back with AI Infrastructure Field Day 1. That's right. We're, we're blowing this whole AI thing up because there's AI for some stuff, but there's still the things that AI has to run on. And that's what AI Data Infrastructure Field Day is all about. So make sure you tune in October 2nd and 3rd for that. And if you want to keep track of all the things that we're doing in this very busy stretch of the next few months, Head over to techfieldday.com. You can uh, download calendar invites for our events. Um, you can also check out all the other things that we do, all the great podcasts that we record, all of the wonderful content that we come out with. And speaking of wonderful content, John, you do a lot of great stuff. And I was wondering if you could tell people where to go to check that out. Well, I'm on TechStrong. So I, use, I do a lot of stuff for the AI dashboard. So if you go to techstrong.ai on the main TechStrong website, that's mainly most what I do. Um, and a little bit of ITSM and uh digital cxo so thanks for the shout out tom and i appreciate it no problem and i want to shout out to all of our great listeners out there you guys keep us coming back every week with great news and and we like to keep it fun for all of you because we love it when you go to our youtube channel at youtube.com slash gestalt it video to watch the episodes we love it when you download the podcast on your favorite podcast application just look for the gestalt it rundown and hey make sure you check out those show notes because i put at least five minutes into writing some of those comedy spots and by goodness i'm expecting an emmy or uh, is it a Tony? Is it a Billy? I don't know. Whatever it is, I want one because I'm going to put it right here on each episode of the rundown. In fact, you know what? We'll just make it a virtual one and I'll have Corey Photoshop it into the background. But until next week, when we come back to you with more great news, make sure you follow all of our social media. We're uh, at Tech Field Day. We're at Gestalt IT. Make sure you also check out Tech Strong TV and see all the good stuff that they're doing. But we'll see you next week with more great stuff. Until then, take care. 